Hi, everyone. Um, I wasn't expecting this to be quite so uh, well attended. So. <laughs> Please bear with me as I deal with my nervousness and talk to you about Git. So um, we're going to start pretty simply. So this is, uh, this is solarized. So I would have like, so in, you know, in my original notebook, I like clone it. But I learned my lesson from yesterday. Like cloning things takes a while uh, on uh, Aussie internet. So I'm going to um, <laughs> skip that step for now. So anyway, I clone it. Um, and uh, oh, so this is this is iHaskell. So this is a Jupyter kernel backend for uh, Haskell. So it, it needs to be bigger. Uh, no, I can't increase the font size because I mean I could, but then you know then everything that's mm, is that does that look okay? People happy with that? Really good. Okay. Cool. All right then. I well let's let's uh thank you. All right. So I'm going to go. So this is a high school. Uh, this is a Jupyter kernel backend for Haskell, which means I can write, um, you know, like pop open a, uh, a Jupyter notebook and write Haskell, which is pretty great. Uh, so and uh, just like GHCI, I can do the thing where I um, go do a colon um, exclamation mark, do do a shell command. So that's what I'm doing. So um, yes. So this is uh, so Git show will show me the most recent commit uh, in the raw format, uh, and the dash s suppresses the diff output because that isn't actually contained in the commit in Git calculates that uh, and spits it out. So this is, a, this is the most recent commit. It has a, a commit ID, a tree, a parent, an author, a committer, and a message. So um, what's actually in the, uh, the git directory? There is a, um, so when you do, when you do a git clone, uh, it has, uh, it, downloading one large file is, is uh, faster than downloading a bunch of small files. So it downloads what's called a pack file. If you're interested in that format, by the way, it's, um, oh no, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, it's available in, um, well, there's a, there's a cool article called uh, Unpacking Git Back Files that I would recommend that you look at. Um, but when we actually deal with, when we actually work with Git repositories, we have a, a small file, uh, a bunch of small files. So I'm going to turn that one large file into a bunch of small files uh, by using a git porcelain command. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's going to take a few seconds. Okay, great. So, um, Let's look at let's look again at the most recent commit. That's uh, again. So a cat file is a is a plumbing command that Git has, uh, and the dash piece for pretty print. So I'm pretty printing the uh, the head, which is the most recent commit. Uh, so again, it has a tree, a parent, an author, a committer, and a message. And it doesn't have a commit ID like it does above, because that's not actually in the commit. So uh, what is head? Head is a file that lives at .git slash head, and uh, this is. Um, points to another file, and this is like a symlink, and it would be a symlink, except Windows doesn't support them all that well, and Git has to be cross-platform, which is why it doesn't do that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at that. Okay, now we get a hash, a SHA-1 hash, 40 characters of SHA-1. Uh, and I, I can look at this file again by doing a git cat file dash b. Let me go ahead and do that. And I get the same output that I got the first time. Um, so this is what, so you know, when I go ahead, at the moment, it's pointing to this, uh, this hash. So what is this hash? There's a, so Git stores all of its uh, objects, which is you know, each of its tiny files, inside uh, the objects directory. And the first two characters of the, uh, of the hash are the directory under, the subdirectory underneath, um, dot, uh, underneath objects. And the next 38 characters of the file are the, uh, sorry, the next 38 characters of the hash are the name of the file. So if I can list the file, confirm that it exists, and I can cap the contents, and I get gibberish. And the reason that I get gibberish is that Git uses um, zlib compression to compress its files. Unfortunately, there's a, there's a command called zlib slate that I can use to uncompress the content. So I go ahead and do that. And now I get something more interesting. So I get uh, almost exactly the same thing I got before. I get the tree, the parent, the author, the committer, a message. But I also get this interesting thing. So this is the, the, the header. Uh, this is a header, yes. The, it tells me the type of object that it is. And it tells me the length of the object. And there's a null byte that you can't see here. But I'll show you in a second that it does, it does in fact exist. So, so far, we've been in um, you know, shell command land. But let's go to Haskell. So there's a zlib compression library in Haskell that I, use, that I like to use. And um, it uses lazy byte strings, but I want to use strict byte strings for everything just because it makes things a little easier. So I'm going to go ahead and define my helper functions, compress and decompress. And I'm going to go ahead and use that to um, do the same thing that I did before with the zlib fake command. Great. So I get exactly what I got before, the tree, the parent, the author, the committer, the message, and also the uh, header and the null byte, which you can see here. So I want to parse this. How do I do that? Uh, in Haskell, you use add a parsec. And, uh, before I get too much further, um, I'm going to go ahead and write passes that don't fail because um, just, just <laughs> because you know I'm perfect. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and do that. Uh, so I want to parse a header. So how do I parse a header? I parse everything until a space. I parse a space. I parse um, a number. I parse my null byte, and I return a tuple containing the uh, the object type and the length. So I parse that. 
and uh, get, the, uh, get the header that I expect. So next thing I want to do is I want to parse uh, 40 characters. So I just parse 40 characters and uh, pretend that's a ref. Go ahead and do that. So now I want to parse a commit. So a commit has a tree, parents, author, committer, a message. And a commit can have multiple parents. So the initial commit of a repository has zero parents, because it's initial commit. And a merge commit can have two parents or more, and that's known as an octopus merge. Um, so I parse that. Again, very easy with, uh, with Haskell, with, uh, with Arrow Parsec uh, and Parsec Combinators. So I parse my tree, a space, a ref, the end of the line. So same with the parent, author, committer. Uh, parse just a byte string for the message, and I return a commit. So I parse my header, and I parse my commit, and I get something that works. Uh, so I parsed it, but I also now want to unparse it or serialize it. So to do that, I essentially just add back in what I took out before. And then I do a quick round trip. So I mean, uh, just so you can see, yeah, so this is like, just I just concatenate a bunch of things together. Um, and it works. And I want to do a quick round trip. So I parse something, I serialize it, um, and then I um, check that they're both equal. They are, excellent. So now I actually want to, um, output this with a header. So I write a tiny with header function that takes the length of my content, uh, some object type, and um, gives me what I got before, the first time when I read it out. So um, we talked about hashes so far, but where did hashes come from? The hash is actually the hash of the content of the commit, of, the, of, 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 the, of any object, actually. So um, let me show you what I mean. So I basically just, again, strict byte strings, take the SHA-1 hash, uh, turn it into a string. If I do that, then I get this. And this is exactly what I got um, before. And that's where the commit comes from. So, you know, the hash uh, that I was using at the beginning was, uh, where is it? Uh, this one, you know, with the, anyway. So, so we've done commits. Now I want to do a tree, uh, which is the next thing. And um, so the tree object is this tree object here. So I'm going to cat file that. So a tree is a uh, directory listing. And um, so this is the root directory of the, of the project, of the Solarized project. So it has all these things. Um, so as before, I would expect that I should be able to um, decompress it and get something meaningful out of it. But I don't quite. What I do get, so I do get a header, and I do get some length, and I get my null byte. And uh, I contend that this is actually the same output. but. Um, so I have like dot, so I have git modules here, and I have this number, just like I do up here. But instead of having this SHA-1, I get this, uh, these bytes. And what's going on here is that um, a SHA-1 hash can be represented as either 40 hexadecimal characters or uh, 20 bytes. And that's actually, that's what, for whatever reason, they decided to do that for their tree objects. So fortunately, it's quite easy to um, write a parser for this. I can, uh, so I can use the base 16 encode, encoding library to uh, encode that. So I just take 20 bytes and I encode them. And then I can parse my tree objects. So a tree is a list of tree entries, makes sense. And a tree entry is a list of uh, entry permissions. So that's what the numbers are at the beginning, like 10644 for a blob, uh, or 04000, I think, for, um, for a tree. The name of the tree entry, so the name of the directory, or the name of the file, and the tree entry ref. So to parse the tree entry, I take a number, a bunch of numbers, I take a space, I take a file name until the null byte. So the reason it, uh, it has a null byte at the end is because uh, in Unix, I think the only character that can, um, the only character that's not allowed in a file name is a null byte, so which is why the user determined that. So I take another null byte. No, oh, sorry. I, I take the null byte that I didn't parse before. I take my binary ref, and then I um, return a tree entry. So if I want to parse a tree, I just parse many tree entries. Makes sense, I think. So then I decompress it, and uh, I should get essentially what I got before. So this is my tree entry permissions. This is my tree entry name. And this is a ref. So I think this is the same one as the one that I got up above. Yes, it is. Excellent. Um, and um, OK, great. So I want to parse it. Uh, I also want to serialize it. So um, I can parse my, I can serialize a tree entry by just adding space and an null byte and um, decoding, the, um, decoding it back to the, the byte format, decoding the, the, I mean the SHA-1 hash back to its byte, uh, byte representation. So again, I do a quick round trip. Um, Works. So I've done a tree, oh, sorry, I've done a commit, I've done a tree, and I want to do a blob. A blob is what Git calls a file. A blob is, um, is just some content. So I chose to do the change log because the, I think the Git module file doesn't really have that much in it. So I chose to do um, this one. This, this uh, uh, yes. So do that. 
And uh, blob is just content. Um, it's literally just a header plus some content, as you can see. So there's a header with some length, an albite, and just some content. So again, parsing this is very, very straightforward. Uh, I just parse, uh, parse a header and I parse some content. So do that. Get my blob with some content. Serializing it is also trivial. Um, I just serialize it. Um, so I've done, so there's four types of git objects. Um, there's a commit, a tree, a blob, and a tag. So we're down to the last one. A tag is a way of naming a ref. So because sometimes dealing with refs is quite frustrating and you just want to like go like, okay, I want this name of this thing. So um, git has a command called show ref, which will show me the tags if it's, if it's called with a dash dash tags flag. So I'm gonna take this first one and uh, get file. Okay, so a tag looks like this. So there's an object that it's tagging. Uh, so it's a SHA-1 that it's tagging. The type of the object that it's tagging, because git tags are usually used to tag commits, but they can be used to tag trees, blobs, or even other tags. Well, we can't see why you want to do that. And um, the name of the tag, the person who tagged it, and the uh, tag annotation. So this is very much like a commit, and we pass it similarly to a commit. Tag has you know, a ref, a type, a tag, a tag, and, a uh, and an annotation. Again, parse it very similarly to the way that I parsed my commit earlier. Uh, again, like I said, it can be either a commit tree, blob, or tag. Um, that it's uh, the type of the object. So I parse it. Um, and I serialize it. Again, just as I did before. Works. So now I bring it all together. A git object can be either a commit, like I said just now, uh, a tree, a blob, or a tag. And if I want to parse a git object, I can read the header uh, and check the uh, check if the header is a commit header, a tree header, a blob header, a tag header, and parse it accordingly. If I can parse it, I can also serialize it um, by using the, the my with header function that I defined before, and I can hash any object by just hashing the byte representation. So I define uh, so I execute that, and uh, I want to quickly check that I did. Uh, you know, this is what I expected. So I take this hash, and I should get the uh, that hash at the end uh, after I do everything. So I hash, so I read this file, I decompress it, I parse it, then I hash it. Yep, and it will get exactly what I got before. So now I want to write a tiny helper function that puts my forward slash in between the first two characters and the next 38 characters. So I just write that down here, split out the first two characters, and I, and I add the, so basically this, I take, given, a, given some, you know, the directory to a git object, and a hash will put the forward slash in and put uh, objects at the front. Pretty straightforward. So given that I've defined this helper function, I can define a read object function. So given a um, directory, it, um, I can read the, you know, I can find the path that I, find my path, I can um, decompress the content at that path and return the um, parsed object. So do that, works as I expect. So if I can write a read object function, I want to write a write object function. Uh, this is kind of where the magic happens in Git, because, um, so I find out where the object is supposed to live, the hash of the object, and then I find the um, the path that is, I mean, the path that is supposed to live at. If it exists, then it has to be the same object uh, because like the hash uniquely determines, um, and you know, SHA-1 does ha is, is susceptible to collisions, but it's unlikely enough that it's not really worth worrying about for Git at this point in time. Uh, so, but anyway, if the, if the hash exists, then uh, we, don't, we don't bother writing anything, but if it doesn't exist, then we write the object in. So do that. So, for the grand finale, I um, basically take every single ref, uh, every single hash that's in the uh, git objects directory. So basically, look, I look at uh, look at all the subdirectories under objects. I look at all of the hash, uh, file names under that. Concatenate them all together. I list all of them, and then I read and write all of them, and I check that they're all equal. So I go ahead and do that. I'll take a few seconds. Yay! Great. <laughs> so that's actually it. You know, that's Git. So, no, seriously, that is. And so you see what I've shown you, but what have I not shown you? Where are the diffs? What happens when you run a git diff? Where do those diffs live? No. So the git diffs are, when you run a git diff, it actually computes a diff on the fly. So git doesn't actually store any diffs. What I've shown you is it stores every version of every file, which is something that you know, blew my mind when I first uh, learned about it, because I'm like, what? Like, it doesn't store the diffs. Like, how does it work then? And this is how it works. Um, so uh, I should point out that this is um, so again. This is this is this is pretty cool, I think, because I've basically shown you how to write, read and write a Git object. I've basically given you an API for Git. But you know, it's like you know, like what? How long did that take? I don't know. 
for inconvenience. <laughs> but you can do a lot of cool things with this. You know, first of all, you, if you can write a, you can write an application that uses Git as a database, which is that's you know the most obvious application to me. Uh, another thing you can do is you can um, you can write in you can like well so one application of that for example is if you can do this you can write you can represent Git objects as data types you can also represent them as JSON you can just write an JSON instance in Haskell or some the equivalent in, in any other language and then you can write a web server that serves Git objects as JSON so I've done that <laughs> which is and that's his project um, yeah and. So, so Pandi is, uh, is an Indian webcomic character who's kind of known for being, uh, being an idiot. And um, so, you know, git, servant. And uh, my, so this is that, this thing that I showed you is a kind of from scratch and re-implementation of, of another project that I did called Duffer, which is more feature complete. Uh, so I haven't actually handled like back file decompression or compression, uh, but Duffer does handle decompression for, of back files and it has a bunch of other features. It, it has the JSON thing that I was mentioning, uh, and it, um, yeah, it handles, it, it does a bunch of other tiny things. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so this is really exciting to me because um, it's a, not only is it a cool project in a way of learning how a uh, version control system works, but people talk a lot about how, what, uh, how, how Git is functional, and like, how is it functional? Well, this is um, the Git tree object, for example, is an, uh, is an uh, implementation of a purely functional data structure in the sense that if a, if a file changes, so what happens when you do a git commit? A file changes. Um, the, fi the fact that the file changes means that the blob, uh, blo uh, it writes out a new blob. The fact that it writes out a new blob means that it writes out a new tree object. And that means that a change propagates all the way up to the root. Um, and this is like, this is one of those, one of those cases where you know, people talk about fun purely functional data structures. But if you're not a, if you're not a functional programmer, uh, it's hard to see why this might be useful, but the fact that you use it every day, every time you like write code, is pretty awesome to me. Um, it's also an entry into parser combinators. Parser combinators are pretty, pretty, pretty incredible. You know, being able to parse these things. Like, I can't think of an easier way to write these parsers than this. I think it's pretty sweet. Uh, and just the fact that you know I can parse a thing and I can parse another thing, that means I can parse both things. Fantastic compositionality. What more do you want? Um, and what else can you do with this stuff? You can, you know, I mean, if you have Git, if you have Git data available to your or to your application as just uh, as just data, you can do this other really cool thing, which um, I should probably um, point out. This is a this is a cool thing that's available in OCaml, but not in Haskell, and that makes me really upset. Um, called Ermin. There we go. So, what I was saying about being able to use it as the backend of a database, like the OCaml people actually went ahead and did that. So they have a database that behaves like Git, and it has different clients. But the fact that you can have a database that you can just plug in, and you automatically get snapshotting, and reverting, and merging, and all these other cool things just for free is pretty incredible. I think it's definitely a more interesting way of, um, interesting way of, I mean, it's a definitely an interesting approach that's worth looking into. So uh, as Manuel mentioned, I used, to be, I used to be a web dev. And one of the, like, easily the most frustrating part of my, uh, my job as a web dev was database migrations. So basically, I felt that the, uh, the database was telling me, look, you, know, you can handle a schema migration, but the data migration, you're basically on your own. And if, you know, if I stuff that up, then customers would lose data, they'd be unhappy, I'd be unhappy, bad, bad things would happen. So what Git tells me is that, look, you might need to, um, for the schema migration, you're on your own, but I'll make sure you never lose any data. And I think that's a much stronger and more interesting guarantee. And I'm, being, I'm interested in kind of working on um, approaches that use that and leverage that. Because I think it's much easier to figure out how to do schema migrations correctly, given that your data is always safe, than it is to figure out how to do, um, well, data migrations, given that your schema is safe. And uh, I guess that's really all I have for you. <laughs>